Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started. So I'll ha hopefully have your pizza and uh, are ready to go. So I am so pleased to welcome you all here tonight for our Legal Issues Masterclass hosted by the Law Society of BC and the Jack Webster Foundation. I'm Christine Tam and I'm the Director of Communications here at the Law Society. It's really nice to see so many familiar faces, uh, both in person, which is so lovely to have you here in person again, and uh, online virtually as well. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I want to express our gratitude to our incredible panelists, Dan Burdett, KC, Kim Boland, Dan Coles, and Bupinder Hundle. Thank you so much for taking the time tonight uh, to be with us. We're really excited um, to hear from you and uh, learn something new tonight. Uh, and of course, we wouldn't be here without our event organizers. So I want to give a huge shout out to Vinnie Ewan from the Law Society and Janet Mitchell from the Jack Webster Foundation. Also, uh, Jillian Shaw is here from the Jack Webster Foundation's board as well. So thank you. And especially thank you for ordering us pizza. We wanted to choose a cuisine that uh, journalists are very familiar with. So uh, hopefully you're comfortable. Um, great. And uh, Vinnie is our moderator tonight. So I will pass it over to her. Please enjoy. Thanks, Christine, and thanks for coming, everyone. Um, i just like to let everyone know that this uh, event is also being live streamed, so uh, welcome to everyone on Zoom as well. Um, I'm Vinny Yu, and I'm a communications officer at the Law Society. And uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, in particular the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And uh, for those joining via Zoom, we invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands that you're on as well. Um, so as Christine said, that this, this event is a partnership between the Law Society of BC and Jack Webster Foundation, and we've been putting this event on since 1994. And as journalists, a lot of you are probably familiar with the work of the um, with the work of Jack Webster, and you, many of you may have attended the awards dinner. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the Law Society's role. So the Law Society is a regulatory body for lawyers in BC. Our role is to protect the public, and we set and enforce professional and ethical standards for lawyers. We also bring a voice to some of the issues that are affecting the justice system and the delivery of legal services. We're governed by a board of governors called Ventures. 25 of the board members are elected by lawyers in uh, nine different regions across BC, and six are public appointees who are appointed by the lieutenant governor and general governor and council to bring their expertise, uh, not only to the decisions that our board makes, but also to disciplinary hearing panels and law society committees. Um, and Jack Webster actually served as a venture of the law society. And he was one of the, one of the first two ventures um, that were appointed without a legal background. And today his legacy continues with the Jack Webster Foundation. Um, I'd like to now invite Janet Mitchell, Executive Director of the Jack Webster Foundation, to come up and say a few words. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. It's wonderful to be back in person and to, to see you. Uh, Vinny and to the Law Society, thank you so much for your partnership and uh, working with us, of course, uh, uh, thank you to all of you who are online with us uh, this evening as well from near and far. Um, and uh, it, it's a pleasure to be able to offer this to not only those who can be here in person in the Lower Mainland, but of course, those uh, who can uh, dial in virtually as well. Uh, to our panel members, thank you, thank you, uh, Dan, uh, for stick handling this. And uh, one thing I'd like to remind you is that at the end of the evening, for those of you that are here in person, we have some feedback forms that we're going to throw your way. And for those of you that are online with us, uh, we will be sending you a feedback form as well that we'd like to uh, get some of your ideas. Um, since I'm here, I'm also going going to uh, give a shameless plug for the November 14th Webster Awards. Uh, we're delighted uh, this year to have in person with us Lisa Laflamme as our uh, featured guest in a fireside chat 
with Gloria Makarenko. Uh, tickets are on sale. Yes, all of the early bird tickets are gone, um, but we still do have tickets uh, for that event. And we're again, thrilled to be back in person for that. Um, I'd like to uh, say thank you to our board chair, Jillian Shaw, who's at the back of the room. And um, thanks for coming out tonight. And she's our fearless leader of the Jack Webster Foundation. So um, if you have any feedback, you can give it to her. <laughs> How about that? Um, thank you so much. Um, now uh, back over to you, Vinny, and uh, let's get rolling. Thanks so much, Janet. Um, so we're gonna start with tonight's program. We're going to be looking at several uh, fictitious scenarios and along the way our panelists will weigh in. I'm pleased to introduce you to our panelists. Um, on my right, Dan Burnett Casey is a lawyer with Owen Bird Law Corporation and over more than 25 years Dan has become one of the most prominent lawyers in the country in the areas of freedom of expression and media law and he has been lead counsel on landmark Supreme Court of Canada cases. Dan is also a trustee of the Jack Webster Foundation and he was called to the BC Bar in 1988. Um, on his right, we have Kim Bolin. Um, she has been a reporter at the Vancouver Sun since 1984, covering some of the biggest criminal cases in Canadian history. She has won and been shortlisted for over 15 major national and international journalism awards including the Courage in Journalism Award in 1999 for her continuing coverage of the Air India story while under death threats. Uh, we also have Dan Coles. Um, he's also a lawyer at Owen Bird Law Corporation. He acts for clients from a wide range of industries with an emphasis on media and defamation law, construction litigation, and helping licensees in the hospitality sector. Dan is an advocate for freedom of the press and other media. He regularly works with journalists and national, in, in, national and international news organizations to obtain access to court exhibits, to oppose publication bans, sealing orders and in-camera court proceedings. He was called to the bar, he was called to the BC bar in 2012. And last but not least, we have Bupinder Handel who is the news director and station manager at Global BC. He has close to two decades of media experience. Before joining Global News, Bupinder was the senior producer for television news at CBC News Vancouver. And from 2014 to 2018, Bupinder was one of the key contributors to Hockey Night in Canada and Punjabi, both in front of the camera and behind it. He's also had a successful tenure as the news manager of Omni Television, overseeing the station's Mandarin, Cantonese, and Punjabi newscasts. He's also a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee Medal. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping details. Um, Uh, for those of us joining virtually, can you please type your questions into the chat? We'll be monitoring it and we'll read out your questions um, to the panelists and there's no need to raise your virtual hand. You can just type directly into the chat. Uh, so we can get started. So those of you who've been um, attended uh, or seen some of the previous scenarios uh, based seminars that we've done uh, might be used to this giant involved twisting turning scenario that we've done we're changing that up a little bit this year because let's face it you know not all journalists are dealing with you know month-long investigative or months-long investigative things all the time we're trying to focus a little more today on a series of mini scenarios that that um that go to some of the more um immediate decisions like today the newsrooms or journalists have to make uh, and also to, um, to highlight some of the things that in feedback from past sessions, people have, have requested of us um, to, uh, to sort of explain those things. Um, the other thing we're gonna be doing uh, is using um, uh, uh, sort of a live polling that, that uh, works for both in person here and people virtually at home. So you, um, I wouldn't do this normally, but you're invited to have your phones out uh, and right away, you'll want to open a website called slido.com, S-L-I-D-O. And, um, and we're going to be polling the room at certain points during the, uh, during the, uh, the session. Um, and um, and uh, the, so 
That'll come up pretty soon. The first series of, of uh, slides we're going to talk about have to do with the kinds of news tips. Oh. Fix that again. That's okay. The kinds of news tips that, um, that newsrooms um, and, and journalists have to deal with are certain kinds of them that are, that are kind of on the tricky side of things. So we'll go ahead and introduce the first, yeah. the first bit. Sure, happy to. Yeah, so we're gonna go over a series of different news tips that are gonna come in. Um, so when a hot tip arrives, what are your first instincts? What legal dangers might be lurking? And we have our first news tip here, the leak. The leak. Everybody, every journalist wants to be the recipient of the leaked document. So the scenario is you've received a leaked government document about foreign influence in the last election. And the, and the question I want to ask the room before I invite the panel to weigh in, just to get a, a sense of things, is what's your first move? So in that Slido, you can type in the code that's on screen, 1983635. Um, and, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, put the poll questions up and, and uh, you'll be able to be able to uh, yeah. So uh, Tipster sends you a leaked government document about foreign influence on the last election. Um, so you have two options. You can either seek verification from the government agency, or you can investigate without revealing the document. So we'll have everybody vote on Slido. Yeah, I'll just give it 15 seconds or so, and we'll uh, see some results. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> see the, yeah, we'll see the competing... Yeah, and for those on Zoom, obviously you can no log on to the answers. same There's website. Yeah. Answers with different implications, I think. Okay. Last five seconds to, to answer your answer the poll and then we'll we'll uh, we'll stop it. And it looks to me like we've got uh, about a two-thirds split here. Uh, two thirds of the of the uh, respondents would investigate without revealing that they have a document, and and uh, about one third, a little over one third, would would uh, seek verification from the government agency as their first as their very first move. So I'm going to stop that poll there. And with that information, what I'd like to do is is kind of invite first Kim to give me her perspective as somebody who's probably been in this exact position a few times in your <laughs> career and, uh, and what your take on it is. Well, I voted with the majority on this one for sure, investigate without revealing the document. But I would say that there are some exceptions to that. If I believe that there could be legal implications depending on the markings on the document or whatever, I would at the very, I still wouldn't go straight to the agency, but I probably would consult an editor, which I don't always do when material comes in because I want to check around first before someone tells me to stop potentially, right? But I, I recently had a, a situation where someone who was a suspect in a murder or a person of interest gave me a document that had been released to them because they were a person of interest, right? And I thought, you know, if I dig deeper, I'm going to find out there's a ban on publication on this, but I was very interested in the information. So I decided not to dig deeper, but I was very careful in how I used the information, right? It was almost more to verify things I already knew, and I didn't quote from it at all when I did do a story. So you have to be really careful you know, it's great that we're having a seminar like this where we've got these legal minds because, you know, you don't want to be in a position where you think you do the right thing by publishing information and then it blows back on you because, you know, you violated a court order or there are legal implications, you know, like those facing Cameron Ortis right now, right? Like, okay. well, Pender, you, you probably had to. Think yeah, about I mean, I, I, I think when you, when you get a tip, you want to kind of do a, if I can use a corporate term, uh, SWOT analysis. SWOT. Yeah, you know, strengths, opportunities, weaknesses. That, that kind of. I think you want to do like a three hundred and sixty of. 
okay, what is the tip? Where did it come from? Do you know who the tipster is or is it anonymous? Um, you wanna ask some of these real pertinent questions and then yes, I agree with Kim. Um, before you go to any government agency, you want to investigate it further and see what you have, see what other information you could obtain that could substantiate uh, what you have received. Um, I think there are cases where you could go to the government agency, but you also have to remember your biggest piece of leverage that you have at the moment is you know something and the government agency in question doesn't know you have it. Uh, and once you reveal that, you've also lost uh, your piece of leverage as well. Um, so it's a very delicate balance in terms of how you want to approach it and, and navigate it. But certainly, um, I, I think kind of doing like a 360 of what the situation is, where it's coming from, what the potential motivation might be. Um, if publicizing this information, um, what does it lead to? Like, these are all things that I, I think a journalist obviously has to be thinking about, but also having conversations about if, and if that's something that's, you know, beyond your scope, it's, it's always good to include other people in the room. Yeah, that's great. By the way, there's a lot of wisdom within the room. So don't be shy to put up a hand if you've got able to weigh in on one of these, uh, one of these points. Um, you can go ahead and put the next little bit up on, on the screen. Oh, Any other? Yeah, yeah that's it. A little too far there. No. The, um, I mean, the, the most obvious instinct is, okay, I got this document, I'm going to reach out to the, let's say it's RCMP, RCMP spokesperson to get, get verification. And uh, I don't know um, if, uh, how many of you know Jimmy Thompson, um, who's, uh, who, you know, great journalist and everything. And so, you know, he was in about a year long battle, I, I, I seem to recall with um, you know, he got um, some leaked information, I presume, from one of the Ferry Creek protesters about um, the case against them and did, did what 90% of people would naturally do is call up RCMP to verify it. And the result was this legal battle and publication ban. He couldn't, couldn't really use it. So I think that's probably one of those examples of exactly the, the problem that you can get into where, where you might want to spend your time, you know, verifying it perhaps through through the not official spokesperson source. I recall a number of years ago, the, the Globe and Mail did a fascinating creative idea where they had a document and they did an FOI request using the details of the document for essentially that document and then got this document heavily blacked out and published them both side by side. And the blacking out was all to do with things that were politically embarrassing, which is, I guess the point of the, point of the uh, story um but there, but you know kim mentioned legal implications dan can you kind of a client news client gets a leaked document calls you up and all excited they've got this leaked document about this explosive interference in the election you know or any other subject and i mean what's kind of a mental checklist that you go through uh privacy is a big one you really you really want to stop and cool your jets for a second to think about what's in this document and how much of it I'm gonna publish. Privacy is a big concept, a really important concept. Personally, I'm a little bit maybe more bullish on what privacy means than, than some people, but it's a spectrum and putting the four corners on what, what is considered private information is not necessarily always easy to decide right away. So I'd go slow, obvious things like, uh, you know, where, people live or, or dates of birth or, you know, obviously bank account information. There's some obvious ones, but there's some less obvious ones that you need to think about. Uh, the Privacy Act in BC, familiarize yourself with it. It's a relatively short piece of legislation, gives pretty good cover for, for journalists who, who publish matters that, uh, so long as they relate to a matter of public interest that are, that are notionally private, but uh, less cover for your source. So also think about that. If someone has leaked a document to you, that's a private document or that person was under uh, undertakings of confidentiality or employment conditions or otherwise uh, moving away from the substance of the document for a second. You don't want to burn your source. So also think about how, how am I going to treat this document or use it in a way that, that isn't going to implicate 
the person who gave it to you. So I definitely want to think about that. Uh, in addition to, to harm to your source, think about other members of the public. If we're talking about foreign interference and maybe nefarious state agents and espionage and all that sort of cloak and dagger stuff, you know, there are, there are real people who, who may be potentially seriously endangered by, depending on how hot the tip you get is. So you have to think about that, that carefully. Um, and, and I suppose the last thing that I was talking about with, with the other Dan earlier is sort of the opposite of the teal cedar scenario where you identify to someone in authority that you have a document and they say, well, you can't publish it. There's also the risk of an O'Connor type application where someone learns you have something, there is um, some sort of criminal proceeding underway and the accused person says, well, I'll take that from you. I'd like a copy of that. And they bring a court application. And of course, if the matter is sub juris, if, if there is some sort of court proceeding or criminal proceeding underway, uh, you also have to think about, about contempt. And that's maybe something we'll talk about in more detail. But if, if this tip, if this document has something that, you know, may prejudice someone's fair trial rights, we have to think really carefully again about how we're going to treat that, that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Oh, thank you. We have a question. How big a part does the motivation of a source in leaking document in, sorry, to a journalist play in your assessment to publish or broadcast? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll weigh in on that one a little bit because, um, because we had a situation um, um, that involved ended up being a very significant libel trial um, where the plaintiff was a former member of parliament. Um, part of the story, a small part of the story had come from a confidential source. Uh, and um, at one point a judge ordered the source disclosed on the basis that there wasn't any evidence that it was a quote, noble source as opposed to some source with some other motive. Um, and thankfully, I'm happy to report that the Court of Appeal in British Columbia overturned that and said, you know, there's often people who have very important things to say um, and, you know, in the, in the status of, say, whistleblowers, um, and they might be violating something by doing so. Or there might be people who, by virtue of having been involved in, say, a criminal organization, uh, know some very important information um, even though they're not exactly angels themselves. So the, the, the identity of the source, I think it's important as a journalist because you're assessing the credibility of the information and what motivations there might be. Are they using you to get a story out? Um, but, um, but from a legal standpoint, the, um, the motivation of the source um, is, is kind of del deliberately not considered to be one of the factors in, in whether whether source protection um, comes to comes to play on that. Um, one of the things, a legal implication beyond what Dan mentioned that I just wanted to touch on before we move forward that, um, that would oh, go back. I want a little. Yeah, I know they, they do. Flicker. They, um, is this, so, so let's just say, for example, and this is not exactly a fictitious hypothetical, but let's just say, for example, the information about interference in the election um, came from CSIS, from somebody within CSIS who perhaps was frustrated at the lack of action. Um, all of a sudden, that, that scenario might put you into a, another legal concern altogether, which is people call it the Official Secrets Act. That's not its name. It's called the Security of Information Act. And there are provisions that deal with, you know, actual classified documents that you have to be live to. And so if you're you know, dealing with that kind of a source, you uh, are well advised to say, you know, to find out um, from the from the source. Like, look, is, it, is this a classified document? Is, is this, a, you know, like a um, in that category? Because I need to consider whether revealing the document is going to is going to put me into a, a crime of that nature. Um, can you go to the next slide. Kim handled handled a story a while back that I I thought kind of tied into. This was a few years ago and it's probably not the only example, but so, I mean, if you've got a document or documents, but you, but you, you, you conclude that you can't really report on the content of the documents, like what's your story then? 
So the example on the screen is from a few years back, but well, you told the story, Kim. Yeah, well, basically, um, disclosure that was covered by a ban on publication in a whole series of gang trials had been posted on this uh, photo bucket website, right? So the existence of it being up there was in itself potentially a violation of a court order. So I wrote about the issue without revealing details of what was in the documents, right? You could sort of tell what, it could have been either side in the gang war, like it could have been the Red Scorpions, it could have been the UN, because they all had overlapping disclosure, right? But based on what was released, I was pretty sure it was the UN side, right? So, um, you know, I got comment, police started investigating. It was still a good story. Um, but yeah, you know, we didn't post details because I knew what the court ordered bans were because the trials hadn't started yet, right? Um, I had a similar case. You mentioned no Connor application, right? I wrote a story which is now a banned story, uh, but it wasn't at the time, you know, about someone who agreed to be a witness in the Surrey Six case. And uh, this was a person who uh, confessed to multiple murders. I can't name him now. He would be uh, person Y, if people know who person Y is. But, you know, he sent me photos of himself. He was really wanted his story told. So we did a big splash in the paper. And I wrote in the story, and this was a mistake now I realized, that we had been in email communication for over a year. And that's how I got to know him, right? And the whole story was based on email conversations that occurred over a year, right? Because he got taken into custody and I never talked to him in person or even over the phone, but I got his permission. He said, anything I've told you over the last year, you can use in the story. But of course, I was asking him all kinds of things unrelated to Surrey Six, because the guy was a gang expert. And um, lo and behold, Jamie Bacon went to court and tried to get all of my emails. Uh, and he was partially successful. I think it was, I think we had to turn over maybe 40 something of a couple hundred emails. And you know, it's kind of like, people will remember, some people remember the forces of darkness. <laughs> Uh, email that Terry Molesky sent when the APAC was it APAC? Yeah. You know, you know, like when you're talking to people, you you speak in their language often, right? Like you're trying to communicate and make them like you, so they'll keep telling you things. I mean, there's things we do as journalists that if you know the outside world was looking in, they might think this was kind of disturbing, right? But you know, we're good at it. This is what we do. So that was really um, challenging for me. And if I hadn't said I had all these emails, you know, as uh, in the body of the story, they might have still gone on a fishing expedition, but I basically told them what I had. So I deliberately now in at times am vague about where I get information. And if we're actually talking about a document, I probably the lawyers maybe shouldn't hear this, but I sometimes pretend I don't have the document <laughs> when I write the story and, and I say, I say that I've been shown a document because I have been shown it, but I also have a copy. But uh, I, because, you know, again, there was a famous case in, was it 94, Juliet O'Neill, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Ottawa citizen, and the RCMP investigated the leak, right? Because it had really embarrassed them, the story that she did. So, you know, they raided her house and the offices, right? To find out, not, not the issue that she was raising by the story, but who leaked the information to her, right? So sometimes it's better not to be a little boasty, oh, I got a secret document, right? And just use the information rather than the fact that you've gotten a document. Yeah. Yeah, I just have a, a sorry. Comment? Sure. Just on the legal implications, I, I didn't say this earlier, but something, Kim, you said um, uh, reminded me, always look into publication bans. Uh, you know, many of my comments in, uh, about legal implications on, on a hot tip or leaked document presume that there's some sort of court process underway. Uh, foreign interference, for example, that may, that may not be the best example, but uh, publication bans will take most people a little bit of work to track down. If there are publication bans in place, exactly what the four corners of the publication ban is. Is it a discretionary uh, common law pub ban? Is it a criminal code mandatory publication ban? When was it made? By what judge in what courtroom? Because certainly, in addition to everything else I said, when you're going to decide what, if anything, you're about to publish from a leaked document, you really want to make sure you're on side of a publication ban. So get working on the publication bans quickly. 
Don't waste a bunch of time thinking about this great story you're going to write when you realize that you really can't connect any of these people to the or dates or information or witnesses to um, the court proceeding. And they're we searchable, have a right? Question. Which, which court website? From, right? We just have a question from Zoom. I'm just okay, gonna... and then, then one live too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, why don't we go to in person question first? Yeah, yeah. I got a note. <laughs> there, were, uh, there, were underway. there were some proceedings underway so i went down to the courthouse and the defense lawyer it was a civil case i had the notice of civil claim and the defense lawyer had applied for a pub ban and a sealing order so i went down both defense and uh, the plaintiff's lawyer acknowledged to the justice there was only there was a reporter in the room i was the only person in the gallery um, I wanted to speak to the application under Dagenet and Mentuck. The justice ignored me, which I found dicey. Um, I'm wondering what we can do in such a case. If we've got the document before the sealing order and the pub ban goes into effect, how do we handle such a thing? Yeah, that's, you know... People have had, I think we should do a seminar one of these days on representing yourself in court because it's happening more and more. Mm -hmm. Resources demand it. Sometimes circumstances demand it, right? So there's a little mental note. Um, but the, um, and, and some judges are better about, about doing what they should do, which is hear you out if you're affected by the order, right? So, um, um, I mean, normally you'd, you'd make it clear, I, I would like to be heard. And then a judge is in a, yeah. Well, anyways, um, the um, unfortunately, if you've got the document and then this publication ban comes in, it's a, you're in the scenario Jimmy found himself in, which is now you've got this. You can do a story, but you can't reveal the information in the document in the story. So it's a bad one. There was another question, I believe, somewhere. I'm, I'm sorry to be moving along quickly, but it's going to do that. When you have a series, uh, a, a long running conversation with the source, but you know, we, as reporters are using more and more things like Signal, where you have your conversation automatically deleted, where have the courts landed on trying to produce uh, correspondence for, between a reporter and a source in those circumstances? Um, I'm just curious, you know, what happens? Well, I guess the Vice Magazine decision out of the Supreme Court of Canada one from the ladder, I can mention. No. Okay, so um, the um, you know that the terrorist admitted self admitted mm -hmm. member of the terrorist organization who was communicating with the reporter from Vice. Mm -hmm. um, um, that case ended up in the Supreme Court of Canada, and it was exactly the scenario you posed. Um, and um, and the court did acknowledge that you know there there's a, a, a sphere of confidentiality to be respected as much as possible for journalists. But the person was, it was basically a signal interview and it was all on the record and the reporter reported some of it and, none, and all of it could have been reported. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the court was like, you know, wh where's, the journal, where's the source confidentiality that we're trying to protect here? And, and uh, so they, uh, you know, they ordered those outed, um, that RCMP was trying to get all the, all the communications. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different situation and not ready for today, but mm -hmm. under the Journalist Source Protection Act, if, if part of the communication or all of the communication is a confidential journalist source communication as opposed to an on the record interview, you're in a very different and very powerful situation now, thankfully, because of that, mm -hmm. that uh, legislation and the decisions that have come down about it where, where uh, the protections are, are, are very strong. Um, just for time, I want to move on to the next. We do. Oh, sorry, there's one, one more, and then we'll move yeah. on to the next uh, tip. Yeah, one more question. Yeah. Um, question reads A retired police officer is your source. They share information from a confidential report on an open case. What consequence could they face if you publish information from that report? Oh, that's interesting. So now you're, you know, because you do have to worry about what, what they face yeah. and, and maybe what your ethics or journalistic. Um, you want to talk about that, Dan, a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty fact-specific, exactly what they would face. But 
I would, I think you could probably use that information in background or, or refer to it without identifying that specific police officer so that he or she doesn't face any consequences. But if it was, if you were kind of careless or bold with the information, there, there could be breach of confidence or breach of trust implications to someone sharing information that they're not supposed to. Um, so I, if, it, if, if it were me, I would say, tread very carefully about anything that could pin this information to that source. Yeah. yeah, for me, I would go and try and get the same information confirmed another way, because I feel like the more like sources you have for the information, the less likely that any one of them is going to be targeted. And then again, sometimes we love, you know, details, as a, especially as print reporters, but sometimes it's better to fuzz it up a little bit too, so that it can't be directly linked to a specific document or meeting or whatever. Um, so th that's what I would do. So far, none of my sources have... Well, some of them have gone to prison, but that's because they've committed crimes. <laughs> it's not related to me talking to them or reporting. Right. We're okay. going to move on to our yeah, let's move on second to scenario. Yeah. You, you know, tip number two, uh, just as an example, we can wrap our minds around. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead, Minnie. Yeah. An anonymous tipster says that UBC is considering suspension of a professor who's been accused of falsifying their qualifications. Uh, UBC is not going to comment until they make a public statement. And the professor says, you are misinformed, but nothing else. So what do you do? And what are your pitfalls? So we're going to go on to slido.com again with the same Yeah, same code. code. And I will watch that poll. Yeah, 19836. Um, what's your first move? Is it if you're satisfied the tipster is solid to just run a story anyways that UBC is investigating. Second option is to wait for UBC to announce the outcome. Third option is to investigate the credentials and run a story with no reference to the UBC investigation. I appreciate there's other options out there, but these are your choices for, for the purpose of tonight. Okay, 10 more seconds. It's like a horse, it's like watching a horse <laughs> race. It's like, oh. Yeah, I think we have a clear winner right. there. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I will stop that poll there. And, uh, and it looked like, what was it, about 61? It was like 50% for investigate. 50% for investigate credentials and run story with no reference to UBC investigation. Right. And I think 30% was if satis uh, if satisfied, I think it was option A. Yeah, no, nobody yeah. wanted to wait or a few nobody people, wanted to some wait. people were going to wait, but not very many. Um, and I should left it on screen there for a bit. Sorry, amateur with this. <laughs> but Bupinder, why yeah, don't sorry, you Yeah, what sorry, what were the results again? Sorry, I was just trying to... The results were uh, <laughs> most, the, the most popular result was investigate and run a story without reference to the investigation of UBC. Um, second was, if you're satisfied the tipster is solid, um, run the story, regardless of whether UBC will officially say, so, say they're investigating. And then the third was just wait and see what UBC eventually tells the world. So- Yeah, I can see why, I can see why wait is last. <laughs> this, is, this is a news but, business, by the way. Yes, it is the news business. You got to come up with something new to, to feed your audience. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, kind of similar to the, 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 the tip uh, situation we talked about, just finding your information and investigating it further and making sure that you have solid information that you can run with, um, I think is always the way to go. Uh, UBC in this scenario, and many other organizations do this typically, they're gonna deflect and they're not gonna, gonna try to avoid you. So that's always gonna be a situation that you're going to end up encountering. Um, but also like, you know, how solid is your tipster is, is the real question. And how much do you trust the information that they're providing you? If you feel like this tipster is like rock solid and you would, you know, you're ready to go with them and you trust them, then absolutely run with the story. 
but if you have an occasional acquaintance and you're not really sure and you know then you need to really spend the time to investigate further so i think it really depends on who the tipster is your relationship with the tipster and depending on what that is then you can figure out which one of those scenarios you want to go with um it is, I, it I, I think that does stage, matter right? I mean, this is oh somebody, yeah, this, this is you're talking career. about somebody's career. Yeah. Um, and and you also have to factor that into your decision making because you are, you know, essentially going to attempt to ruin someone um, by going public with this. So um, that's why it's important to 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 factor how reliable you think this person is. Um, but you need to continue to investigate further as to whether or not there is legitimacy in the claims. And in the situation and scenario we're talking about, a lot of that legwork was done um, before these stories came out, which gave it solid foundation that allowed for other events and cascading events to, con to, to, to continue on the dominoes to fall. Um, so that's a real important element that, you know, once you get a tip, you, you know, you, you got to keep digging. It's a key part of it. You get a thought of this one, Kim? Yeah, I think I I should change my vote based on hearing Bupinder. I voted like go like go with the story, but again, it really depends on who the tipster is. If it's someone in authority at UBC that you happen to know, but again, just the fact they're investigating doesn't mean it's true, right? It's not a criminal case. It's not a case where the public is at risk. That might change my perception if it was an allegation that you know an instructor there had done something nefarious and. The, public was potentially at risk, I might have a different view, right? But something like this, it should be pretty easy to hold on and do some digging for a day or two and get your own confirmation, right? So I'm changing my vote. Yeah, it, it okay. really does, it really does depend on on what the story is. Yeah. And what is the act that they are going to be suspended for? And again, um, legal implications, I guess, will come into play that if you run with a story and someone is being investigated about something, you don't know whether or not that is actually true or not, um, you do run the risk of, of this individual, if they have an impeccable record to that point, and you haven't investigated further enough to really solidify the claim as to, as to what they might be um, accused of doing, um, you also run the risk of facing legal action yourself. So there's yeah. a multitude of elements that you have to consider before you jump into it. So Dan, what's your legal brain saying about this? I'm trying to think of the, I'm sure it's a British case where a defamation judge cautions how difficult it is to write about smoke without describing a fire somewhere. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, kind of is what Bupinder is talking about is that from a defamation point of view and potentially ruining someone's career, writing about a suspected fraudster and writing about a fraudster is, is kind of like dancing on the head of a pin. You know, you want, if you are going with maybe a single tipster, someone you really trust, or, or you jump on a story quick, you haven't, you don't have a bunch of, uh, corroborating information you so you want to be careful in case you're wrong thinking about how you're going to write this talking about you know an investigation or a suspicion or something like that i think a more creative mind than mine would have to figure out a safe way to write that unless we're going to go for gusto and and get down to the nitty-gritty about dates and places and institutions and and you have the goods and we'll talk about what the goods would look like earlier or later. Yeah, I mean, you know, you oftentimes with these things, people immediately go, well, proof is a complete defense. Truth is a complete defense. And, and then it's like, okay, well, you step into the shoes of anybody who's actually been to court and has had to prove things to a court standard of evidence with firsthand witnesses. Um, you know, it, you know, you call up the person's previous institution are they going to send you all their records probably not like you know it, it's actually it, it's an effort if you want to write about like a professor who did their education decades ago and you, and you want to prove that they didn't obtain the degrees or the grades or write the papers or that they have said they did going back to the 90s or the 80s or the 70s 
to, to actually track down what graduating class they were in and, and where they ranked in that class or what high school they did or didn't go to or where they lived. It looks really good when you can just see it on someone's LinkedIn profile and go, oh, that one must be true. But Or, or their heritage. Or, or, yeah, their, or their heritage. We have an yeah. online question. Okay. If you determine that professor's credentials are falsified through your own investigation and are sure of the facts, does the fact of a UBC investigation give you legal cover for your published story? I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Um, I mean, unless your story is about the investigation and you're able to confirm that there's an investigation underway, then you know, to a certain extent, you're reporting on that fact and that's a matter of public interest that there's, it's going on. Um, but, uh, but in the end of the day, I think Dan's probably right that if you're gonna do this story, um, as much as you might try to dance around, it's probably going to involve an allegation of falsification and you better be able to either prove that or prove something that's going to be part of our next scenario, which is that you, that you um, investigated and presented the story responsibly, even if it turns out that it wasn't perfect, um, which puts your, all your journalism under the microscope. And that's how we're going to which we're going to turn to on the very next one, which let's go to yeah, now. Yeah, we're going to have, this is our third scenario. Um, there's a reporter at your newsroom meeting that says she has four sources ready to talk about sexual assaults by an actor named Russell. You have to get his response before breaking the story. But what exactly does that mean? What do you have to do to get his response? So I'm just going to... Um, frame that a bit. People, I think, all know that there's this very important defense that has been very successful in, uh, in defending um, journalists on big stories called responsible communication. And broadly speaking, it's, it's uh, the court looks at all the things that the journalists did. Did they ask the other side for uh, their side of the story? Did they report it? Did they do a proper investigation that's commensurate with the seriousness of the allegations? All those kinds of things. And, um, but the, you know, the going to the source and putting the story to them is, or putting the allegation to them for response is kind of, it, Supreme Court of Canada calls that the core of that test. Um, and so what it boils down to is, uh, at least I, the way I see it and in, in my experience is, is what exactly does that mean? What, is it, what exactly does it mean to, to have gone to the other side? Uh, I've seen um, some journalists say, well, I left them a message to call me. So, you know, it should be pretty obvious that will not even remotely cut it. Um, I, I said, we're doing a story about your credentials and asked them to call. That's still not going to cut it. I, I, I've been in trials. Dan and I were together in a big trial where, where it was all about, did the journalist provide sufficient information about the story and, and the stings to the person so that they could intelligently respond? And did they have a reasonable time to do that? Um, I'm going to... I'm going to pull the room, including our, our panel here in a moment here. But Dan, do you want to weigh in a little bit on, well, I'll get to timing in a minute, but on the level of detail that ought to go to a person? I mean, I mean, it could be never ending. You sure. could, you could yeah. say, here's my draft story. Here's all my notes and here's my sources. That's, that's too much. But you have to put what, the what thrust. Is, is right? there some way of testing it? The thrust of, I guess, the allegations, for lack of a better word, and yeah, you have to be pointed enough that if, if you're going to run a story about a friend, Russell, about uh, sexual assault in his past, then you better not ask him about why he was fired from his last employer. You have to put that to him. You have to put all of the um, defamation, I guess we call them the stings, the bad stuff. And with reasonable detail, because someone like Russell may have done a whole series of questionable things, and you're not going to be able to write about all of them. And Maybe he's not thinking about all of them, but before you go to the, the target or the subject of your story, you have to have a pretty good idea of what you want to write about. And that may change. If it changes, you may have to go back to Russell before publication if it changes dramatically. But think about what you're going to say and what they're going to complain about later and satisfy yourself that you gave this person an opportunity 
to understand and respond. And just before I leave the topic, um, call a phone number that you know is current. I've, I've dealt with journalists who left voicemails and they weren't really sure that was a current number. It was a number they got off a tenant's lease and I don't know, email accounts, Facebook accounts, make sure those are current. If, if you're gonna write about someone who's under a cloud of scrutiny and they've, they've escaped the city to, to get away from the press, don't go knocking on their door three nights in a row when you know full well they're not home, right? I mean, we're gonna get into this hopefully a little bit, but this is all going to be scrutinized. So you need to, you need to be able to eventually potentially satisfy a judge or maybe at least your editor that you made bona fide contacts to the best of your ability, more than one attempt typically, to, to get a comment and that this comment was a fair caption of, of what the story was gonna be about. Uh, I'm gonna ask both Kim and, and, and Bupinder, do you, do you have a sort of a particular barometer when I go to the source and I know I need to put, put it to them, is there some way you approach that in a consistent way or, or does it depend on all the facts? It depends on the type of story it is. I mean, I called a guy today and I'm like, I didn't double check the phone number. Right, but it was U.S. court allegations, so I thought I was on safe ground, privileged. Uh, but you know, if I had more time, I would have gone out and tried to knock on the door. I didn't do that, so it really depends on the story and where the allegations are coming from, and how serious they are. Uh, but yeah, like you can't phone someone at 4 p.m. when you've been working on a story for a week or two weeks or a month. And they're not available. And so you go, oh, they declined to call me back, right? And I mean, there were people, I would say 20 years ago in my newsroom that will probably do that on occasion, right? So I, I think you have to give people every opportunity to respond. You have to also, you know, we as journalists sometimes, you know, we, especially if you've been working on something for a while, you're, you know, they're kind of the enemy because you've dug out all this stuff on them, right? And, you know, then you meet them and they're actually really nice, reasonable people. And, you know, you got to keep that in mind, right? That, um, you know, you, you not only want to get a comment, you want to get a fair representation of their view on the whole issue, right? So uh, if they can sit down with you, give them the opportunity to do that. Why not, right? You're going to have a better story, right? Sometimes you do that in a follow, right? But um, I, I think if you've been working on something for a period of time, you have to give someone at least a few days to respond. Can I just jump in quickly and say also, just think about language also. If you're writing about someone who you think probably doesn't speak or understand good English, an email to them strictly in English, that person may legitimately otherwise deny understanding that. So also just think about how you're gonna communicate with someone. Showing up at someone's door who just speaks Russian and you don't, you know, it's not going to get you very far. Do you have a particular sort of standard you expect from your people when they, when they put serious allegations to somebody before completing a story? Well, I think that there is an obligation on our part to be specific, to get a specific response to a specific allegation. Uh, try to be as objective um, and impartial in the framing of your questions, but ask very pointed questions. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> And I will always say in, in terms of, of communication and, and giving reasonable opportunity for people to respond, um, you know, you don't want to end up in a situation where um, you didn't give enough time and they're at their kid's soccer game or whatever and didn't pick up their phone and that's why they didn't respond to you. You don't want to get into that kind of situation. Um, so I think it's just kind of being reasonable um, and thinking about what would be reasonable if you were in that situation. Um, did I get a fair opportunity to respond? And, you know, if somebody called me, uh, I would say right now about an issue, um, you know, let's just say Global BC was under the gun for something right now and somebody called me right now, I'm probably not going to get back to them relatively quickly at this moment, right? Um, person might be busy doing something, they might be going home to something else, they may not get your message, they might not be in a, a position to respond probably until the next day or the day after that, like, you know, just be reasonable about the situation you would be in and, and, and what that might look like or others. And then if you felt like you've given a reasonable amount of time, then I think you're good to go. But multiple attempts, like just not that one little attempt uh, is not going to cut it. It's like the phone call, it's the message, it's the email, it's, it's a multitude of things that we just got to make sure that we've made every attempt. 
uh, to reach the person. And then, then if they haven't responded, then at least we've done yeah. you know, our due diligence and making sure that we've given a reasonable amount of opportunity and time for the person to respond. And as we long as we can do that, then we're on solid footing. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. Question reads, do you have any obligation to warn the person about the implications of their silence or choice not to respond? Um, my view is no. I don't know if others. Yeah, I would veer away from that. Disagree. Like, I mean, I mean it, it almost sounds like an intimidation tactic. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, 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 it, but, but, it, but it's true, though, that the law, because of this defense has come into the, into the law with, with such force, that what one could do 20 years ago and just say no comment, um, that's a pretty unsophisticated response these days because, because you know, you've, you've acknowledged the question, they refuse to give anything and you can report that you tried and, uh, and their side doesn't end up in, end up in the story, which, you know. Um, people have talked a couple of times about, about, you know, okay, well, how, exactly how long? Like, what is it? Is it, is it you know, how many hours or how many days or whatever to respond to a serious allegation like the one in the scenario? So that is our next whole question. Response time. Uh, I think we need like Jeopardy music. <laughs> yeah, ba, da, da, da. So how long do you give the person? Okay, you've got these allegations, you've given them, let's just say, you know, there's there's these four allegations of sex assault. Here are the are particulars of it. You, you're satisfied that you've been detailed enough. How long do you give them to respond? And I've given you four options arbitrarily, 24 hours, 48 hours, seven days, 14 days. Let's see what the see what the uh, the room thinks about about that. Let's see. I love watching this little horse. Really it's fun. <laughs> so since we're just waiting, I can maybe just one thing that that question reminded me of, which we didn't talk about, is sometimes people just hang up on you, right? So I phone people back if they hang up on me, because again, it's the same thing. Someone's upset because you've just, you know, said they're going to be in the media for some reason. So I think it's fair to call back. Like if then they hang up again, I don't keep calling back. Yeah. Right. I'm also a big proponent of putting it in writing. I mean, yeah. even, even if that's a follow-up by way of like an email, or, because then nobody can deny that you ask them specifically about a certain thing because it happens where people oh no you didn't tell me you're gonna write about that well yes i did there mm -hmm. isn't my email to you but i also record when i call them you, yeah and they well, hang and up on me okay so let's see the room says survey says uh 48 hours gets i'm at the reading glasses 64 64 percent seven days 33 percent 24 hours three percent 14 days nobody is given the person 14 <laughs> days so, um, so let us just see what the Times of London did with Russell Brand. Eight days. I don't know why they picked eight days. Maybe it's so they can say it was more than a week. We gave them more than a week to respond. Maybe they just genuinely thought, well, you know, it's going to take them a couple of days to collect themselves and a couple of, anyways, but they didn't want to be seen. And, and you know, it's a, the defense over there is roughly the same as it is here. And they wanted to be sure that as much as possible that they were not going to be seen as having, as having uh, um, given too much of a short fuse. So I thought that was an interesting thing. As it happened, he did issue a, a response by way of a, like a YouTube video on day eight, I think it was, oh. and uh, which kind of changed the story a bit. And, yeah. and one of the questions that comes up from time to time is, Okay, well, what if the person says they need more time? Within reason, give it to them. You're gonna look like a journalist who's trying to jam a story without a full opportunity otherwise. If, they're, if it's pretty obvious they're just stringing you along, then that'll be obvious. I mean, it, 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 oh, I, I, can't, I can't possibly respond for a month. Well, no, I, I need, you know, I, I'm talking to a lawyer about this, about what I should be saying and not saying, and I need it you know, three or four more days or five, give it to them. And, and uh, you know, if it's an investigative story like that, it's, um, you know, you, ha you have to 
give up the urge to get it to get it to, to get it to print or to air um, in favor of making sure because because believe me on you know on allegations like these it's not like not like you're going to be in a position necessarily to prove it firsthand. There's going to be a huge battle over what actually happened and whether there was consent and on and on. And uh, you better have your responsible communication ducks in a row, so to speak. Yeah, to put it in context, if you've been investigating something like credentials at UBC or yes. someone like Russell for months or maybe years, and that is all going to come out in a potential defamation trial, and on the other side of, of the scale, you gave the subject of your story a week and you, you wouldn't hold off for another couple of days. It's not a good look and it's terribly disproportionate. And if you and your team and your newsroom have been diligently working away for months, don't compromise a responsible communication defense at the goal line because you out of principle, you wouldn't agree to another week. I'm with you, Dan. Yeah. That's okay. There's a slide about, uh, I'm just gonna make the point that sometimes the circumstances as they evolve kind of guide the story, right? And guide what's responsible. Um, Russell Brand posting a video. Um, I mean, the John Gomeshi story wasn't, wasn't a story at all until he went public, right? And then, then, then came more of a story. But let's move on to B, and, and I, we have to move a little quickly because we're a bit further behind time than I wanted to be. But I just wanted um, something that has been requested by a few journalists is something we have, we've never really talked about at one of these um, sessions, and that is, what about online copyright of images, things like that? And so, um, yeah, go now. Oh. It's like freaking out on me. There. Ah. Are you? Okay, I will let you, I'll let you try to get that back. Okay. Just go back one if you can. Can you manually go back? There, there you go. You got a, 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 a sensitive trigger on the thing. Um, I'm, I'll be curious to know whether anybody in the room has had an experience, anything like this. Journalist, uh, and this is from a true, all those slightly name, name removed situation. Copyright demand notice from a company called Pick Rights or something like that. Uh, demanding payment of a couple of grand and the removal of an image they say belongs to their client, Associated Press. Um, an image, an image that was grabbed from social media in the course of doing a news story. Um, you know, let, let's say it was some fast moving news story out of town. You couldn't get somebody there. We found a really good photo of, of uh, an explosion or something. Um, uh, and it seemed to be floating around social media anyway. So, what, what, you know, isn't that what fair dealing is? So, curious. I, I saw one hand go up. Has anybody had the experience of receiving a sort of a, hey, you violated my copyright notice? Do you want to, can you share it all? Yeah. No, I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm it. Uh, a publisher for um, one of the, publications I write for uh, did receive a request for payment for a couple of images from the Abbotsford flood uh, a couple of years ago that uh, had been provided to her by Reuters. And um, she was in touch with Reuters and uh, even reminded them that they hadn't invoiced her for the first image when she asked for the second image. And uh, yeah, just this spring, she got approached by pick rights for payment for the images, and she's never received an invoice from Reuters, which provided the images to her. Really? Well, I, if you've ever heard of them, pick rights, but, but that's uh, kind of the top, or at least the most prominent, I'll call it enforcer organization these days, and they use an algorithm to scour the internet, they find images, uh, they then go to their various clients and say, hey, AP, or hey, La Presse, or hey, Canadian press, which is one of their clients, do you want to pursue this? And they send a demand and then, then it, you know, get, gets jacked up to the lawyer at a certain point if there's not a response. So, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a scenario where it, it, it behooves journalists and organizations to kind of know what their, what the situation is legally. And I thought I'd spend a bit of time on that, but first, a code. This time we need a, you're going to put a new code in. So go a couple of back arrows on Slido. 
where you can put in a new code, 2522405. It's 2522405. Not nothing over the road again. Um, and, uh, and this question is how to respond to a copyright notice. I'm interested in how the room would respond. So your options are, you got a letter from pick rights or something like that, or even a law firm, let's say. Ignore them. It's either a scam or an obvious case of fair dealing. B, if, if it is an AP image, take it down, apologize, and pay up a couple of grand. Or C, have your lawyer send a letter defending use of the image. I won't vote because I'm in a conflict on this one. I'm just trying to get more business. Um, I think we're going to be, be seeing more of these as people publish stories and we're all in a hurry and grabbing a thing because it's a wildfire and it's up in Kelowna and we're not. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, oh, that image is owned by some, somebody who cares about that. Um, okay, just a few more seconds. It looks to me like we have a, a majority uh, opting for C, have your lawyer send a letter defending use of the image. Um, the second case is B, uh, take it down, apologize. Um, and, uh, and least popular is, is ignore them, which is probably good. You just don't, you know, don't assume it, it, it there's nothing to it. Um, I thought I'd spend a moment on, um, well, actually before I, before I get it in terms of the legal basics, Kimber Bupinder, have you, you guys had experiences like this? whether it's a pick rights kind of organization or just some commercial photographer who is like, Hey, wait a minute, you use my stuff. Yeah. I mean, you can run into these types of situations. I'll just throw a random example. Um, couple married couple are on vacation somewhere, a natural disaster hits or something. And, you know, it was their honeymoon and, you know, just as you get into telling the story, you're taught, you know, you're showing that, oh, it was supposed to be a wonderful honeymoon and they got married like a week ago and this and that. And you show these beautiful wedding photos or a video from the reception or whatever. And then a little while later, you get slapped with a copyright because the photographer says you use my images without my permission or use my video without my permission. So the couple has given it to you just to, you know, you as a journalist ask, um, oh, you know, it'd be a great way to tell the story visually that, you know, uh, they got married and now they're in this predicament or whatnot. Um, but yeah, then you can get hit by the photographer. The photographer does not care about the couple or their story, right? Um, but they do care about their image. Yeah. Um, so that's one situation, for example, where it's, it's quite innocent. You want to do a great story and all of a sudden, uh, you're in a little bit of a copyright predicament, as, and that has happened. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Well, you have to you have to either credit them or pay them. Yeah, yeah. Because um, it is it is their image, and you know it's it's their copyrighted image. They own it, um, and you do have to reconcile. Well, I think it's fair to say that as as journalists, we're often in the other side of the situation, right? I mean, there's probably a number of journalists who have who have had their images grabbed by somebody else and end up on some aggregate site or whatever else. So it's, you know, it, it kind of cuts both ways. But I thought what I'd do is just um, briefly give sort of a copyright basics on this and some best practices that I suggest. On the basics, um, one thing you need to know is that is that images don't have to have a copyright warning on them to be copyrighted. Every every image is by law owned by the person who took it or their employer, if they took it as part of their employment. That's just the law and, and nobody needs to put a warning on it. And in fact, there can be a lot of uses of, a, of an image that are non-commercial online, social media, people might post their own. 
then people might grab it and use it on their Twitter or their Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, and they're perfectly entitled to not worry about those, but but do worry when it's on global news or it's on the Vancouver Sun. Um, and so, you know, it might seem like a double standard, but suddenly it's being used for a commercial purpose and, mm -hmm. uh, and you need to be uh, live to that. So, um, you know, what are the best practices bearing that in mind? Um, maybe skip two forward to the best practices slide. The demand was kind of already described. You know, I, I seems some of this may be obvious, but, you know, generally use your own images or get permission. And I see more and more people, you know, outright asking um, for social media images permission. Um, there are times when, you know, like it's a wildfire story or it's a story that, you know, it happened quickly. It's really important, um, but you don't have the image. And there is a thing called fair dealing that applies to, um, you know, images used even without permission for news purposes if they're used fairly. And you have to kind of understand what fairly means. Um, uh, my take on it is if an image is freely shared by a non-journalist and it's, and it's there and there's a house in Kelowna getting burned up and you wouldn't have otherwise had the image, you know, get, get permission if you can, but often if you can't figure out whose it is, you're fine to run it and you credit whatever source it was, whether it's Instagram or otherwise. Um, and that's going to be a pretty textbook example of fair dealing and you're going to be legally safe. Um, what is not fair? Grabbing a competitor's image, right? Almost ever. I mean, I, I can't really think of an example where, where a court would say, oh yeah, that was fine. I mean, as opposed to, you know, if you really didn't have the image, as opposed to going to them and saying, you know, look, can I, can I license your image? It, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, key to the story and then having an upfront conversation about it. Um, and you can go to the next. Sorry, slide. Dan, one question there. Yeah. What about a cute cat video? Oh, actually, that's a very good Viral point videos, because, yeah. because, and, and I think um, Rupinder asks this because fair dealing requires certain uses news, education, review, and criticism. Is a cute vac cat video any of the above? Satire. <laughs> maybe satire, <laughs> maybe water skiing, squirrel, whatever it might be. Um, so grabbing those kinds of images probably doesn't get you any fair dealing defense, even if you credit the person, because you're not going to fall into any of those categories that fair dealing must have. What, what do you mean by freely shared and who is someone? Um, so I'm thinking of a, a corporate website. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was... I'm glad you clarified or asked a question that allows me to clarify that. What I mean is, is um, um, yeah, if you were to grab somebody's professional image off a corporate website, that, you know, that's, that's getting more iffy. But when I say freely shared in the example of say the Kelowna wildfires or the, any of the wildfires in, across the, um, you know, this part of the world, um, you know, uh, an image that, that uh, somebody has obviously put on Instagram and somebody's forwarded and shared it. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And they're not a journalist. Like they're just, you know, and, you know, prize you might, you might not be able to figure out who actually owned it. You can see, and you've just, all you've got is a, is a source of where it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you do your best. And, and that's all the law requires is credit the source. You don't even have to credit the owner if you don't know who it is. So, mm -hmm. um, so anyways, that's all I meant by that. Thanks. There's a question. Okay. Okay, we have some interesting questions here, and for the sake of time, feel free not to maybe um, go quickly on these. I think this one was answered. How about an instance where you discovered a news organization used your photo image without your permission, uh, which I think you answered, but um, if not, and then for the giving credit, if a picture is posted to a site like Reddit, where people don't use their real name, is it okay to put the account name as the photo credit, um, and then? sort of all related, what if the image had been on social media and widely used, but then one competitor pays for the rights of use after the fact, uh, maybe even two hours after the fact, um, is that still fair to use? Um, what was the first one again? Someone if you're uses... an individual, 
sorry, I lost it. I think um, it was with their picture was posted by a news organization, right? An individual. I thought it was one news. Were you discovered? I mean, I think, you, yeah. Yeah, well. Um, We're gonna cover that next, right? Um, sorry, it's hard to keep track of, of all those in. in um, I think the first can I, can one I was- answer yeah. one? Yeah. Like, okay, so this happens a lot, you know, especially if you've been on a beat for a long time, you have your own photos, your news organization has the photos. They are often taken by other news organizations. And I had like Newfoundland TV literally three weeks ago post a story and the two images in it were our exclusive images. I We don't belong to Pickbright as far as I know, but I, that makes me mad. So I actually emailed the newsroom in Newfoundland, I said, you know, these are exclusive photos. You didn't ask us to even use them. And they were extremely apologetic and immediately took them down. And I was kind of like, well, actually, as long as you have our name, we don't really care, right? So I do feel like that courtesy is kind of gone by the wayside, Bupinder, would you say? That used to be kind of a common thing where you'd ask uh, another news organization and you'd give them credit. And yeah. we generally share, right? But now people just take things and- Yeah, we should be doing that. We shouldn't do that, right? We should be doing that. Yeah. And I, I won't get into details, but I ran to that same situation today. Right, okay. So it it's, me, right? no, <laughs> but um, we got to do that. Uh, yeah. that's, that's really important. And um, I think just for integrity purposes of our own craft, um, I, I think it's important that we're all on the on the same level on that one. Yeah. That if we are gonna um, if we are gonna use each other's uh, images in any kind of way, that we do seek permission to actually do that and, and do it above board. Yeah, and I'm sorry I won't be able to answer all those questions because of time, but but I will say add one thing to the best practices, when, which is you know if you've got an image that that you know you you realize is genuinely a very significant image that is yours either because you've commissioned it to be, to be taken or because one of your people has, has taken it and it turns out to be a very significant you know, thing about the riot or whatever. You don't have to legally, but put a copyright notice on it. Like, yeah. like, you know, like actually make it be upfront. The, the, the people, people do that for the purpose of letting the world know, even though they sort of ought to know. Um, timing wise, oh, okay. Like it's a controversial photo that somebody took and you're, you're, you're like making a story about that, that photo got taken or got posted somewhere. I mean, that'd be a classic sort of textbook example of, of where that it is the core of the story. And so fair dealing is going to plainly apply. You do still have to credit the source. Um, it's, it's, I think, best to ask to use it. But, but, but even with a no, you, you could be pretty confident in, on, just on the, without getting too detailed in the facts, if the story is, you know, the photo is the story. There's a famous British case involving a whole episode that was all about why we have a tabloid culture. And the whole story was basically illustrated with tabloid headlines, none of which were paid for. And they, success, they, they successfully defended on fair dealing for them all, because that was what the story was. Um, we need to move on uh, and uh, to a- Yeah, we, uh, we and, and I apologize this. to questions that not been answered now. Let's go right to the next yeah. and final scenario, because this is a important one that we don't talk about. And that is, well, you, talk about, but not enough, identity bans. And what exactly does an identity ban prevent you from publishing? We have identity bans in young offender cases, we have identity bans in when there's sex cases the, on the victims, we have identity bans quite often on undercover officers, lots of examples, but not necessarily a lot of clarity as, as to what exactly does an identity ban prevent you from using beyond the obvious photo or name. Um, there's a trial that's still going on after many months now, uh, Ibrahim Ali. Um, it's a uh, trial where the fellow was charged with murdering the Burnaby teen who was found in Burnaby Central Park, uh, whose name I'm not going to say because I'd be in violation of a ban. And it's not going to be on the screen either. Um, sorry, I wasn't quite done with that. Um, the... Um, 
So what happened was there've been all sorts of stories prior to trial where there wasn't a publication ban that named and showed the photograph of the Burnaby teen um, to the point where most people know that case by the name of the teen. Most of you in the room probably do. Um, but then, then shortly before trial, boom, publication ban on her identity, even though she was deceased. The courts have upheld those kinds of things on the basis that that kind of identity ban is designed to make other people come forward. So it, they don't necessarily end their importance when somebody uh, passes away. But all of a sudden we had this surprise identity ban um, and I'm sure Bupinder, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in because, oh. because uh, you were probably on the ground when all of a sudden you're thinking, well, do we scrub our old stories? How do we possibly even describe the case without everybody knowing what the person's name and identity is? You know, and, and how, do you, how do you start identifying that person going forward? Yeah, a, a really tricky scenario because the case is known by reference of the name of the victim. And now we are in a situation where we cannot name the victim, but every single person, like if you mention the victim's name, it'd be like, oh yeah, I know about that case. That was the, the thing, the thing, the thing. Like, you know, people know. Um, but now you're, you're left with only being able to name the accused. Um, so it presented a number of problematic situations. You've done a whole bunch of reporting uh, using the victim's name. Um, do we go back and scrub all that reporting now that the ban is in place? Ultimately, uh, we didn't. Uh, but moving forward, we certainly have not used the name. Um, one of the things that obviously um, we looked at options of mounting a challenge uh, in reference to that. Um, and Dan, you could probably speak more, more to that part of it. But you know, one of the things just from a public interest standpoint is you heard about this case with regards to this victim, but you will never be able to know what the conclusion was with regards to the case involving this victim, unless you know the name of the accused in conjunction with the victim. So that was a real tough one for us to kind of, you know, wrestle with, to be honest, to be like, you know, people will want to know, just do a random Google search and, and just be like, I wonder what happened with that, with that so-and-so's case. And they're not going to know whether or not the person is guilty or not guilty or whatever the conclusion is like, it's going to be like a mystery. Um, now people could put two and two together, but there's many steps now that people have to go through in order to put two and two together. Um, so yeah, that, that, that has been a particular situation that um, is quite problematic. Um, obviously, um, it's hard to tell the story moving forward uh, in that kind of scenario. Um, but we also took a, a firm stance as a news organization that we're not gonna go back um, and, and, and take away or delete any of the work that had been done to that. And it's years of work and years of storytelling uh, that went into that. I have a similar situation quite often, not this terrible case that's still before the courts, but you know, where you get people in gang cases and they're pleading guilty and they're getting sentenced and you cover that and it's in open court and you use their photos if you've got them copyrighted. Uh, and then they become cooperating witnesses. And then they become person A or person B or C or X or Y, right? And because we are so interactive now in our journalism, which I think is fabulous, like the public is asking us in public forums, like comments on our websites or through Twitter or through other means, oh, whatever happened to so-and-so? And they're naming someone who was convicted of murder in open court and you can't comment. And I've found that I take, I block people on Twitter that are asking me like just nice questions about a story I wrote because I don't want to be involved in explaining publicly, well, that guy's got a ban on his name now. I can't say that, right? So I, I do find this 
I don't feel sometimes like the court thinks this through, especially in the case of cooperating witnesses who are bad guys, because they get new names as part of their deal. So they're old names. Like I, I actually have argued in favor of, okay, I, we won't use, I, I agree, we shouldn't use their photo because that could endanger them potentially. But their old name, I think, should be fair game, but the courts will side uh, with the crown on that every time, right? So it is problematic. And, and I think you have to be really careful on social media or even like a reader is emailing you, you know, you can't basically answer questions that seem like legitimate questions. Oh, so many angry Without emails. violating There's a ban. So many right? angry emails. Yeah. Just about, why are you not saying the victim's name? Why, why, why? It's yeah, like yeah, exactly. over and over and over again. Every well, time we do the story. Well, and the victim's name is all over social media. Yes. And nobody yeah. gets prosecuted, but it ends up but, in, you know, on global news. You. They'll get prosecuted. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. So um, the good news, or really a, a less bad news, is that <laughs> you're absolutely right to, to have not scrubbed the earlier stories. The Supreme Court of Canada has made that ruling uh, in a case from 2018. Um, although you do have to be careful not to link back to those stories that name and so forth. Um, but Dan, maybe you can weigh in a little bit on what kinds of information and combinations of information can get people into trouble with identity bans. Yeah, I mean, super fact specific, of course, uh, goes back to what I said earlier, make sure you understand the nature of the ban. If it's a criminal code ban, it might be very specific to only relating to underage persons, may only relate to witnesses or other justice system participants and not typically, of course, an accused or other witnesses. So just if you can, and again, I'm sympathetic to journalists, it's not always easy to figure out the four corners of the ban. But once you have that, and it may be quite sweeping, you do have to turn your mind to what is the information that is likely to identify the person protected by the ban? And it could be just about anything from you know age and, and sex to occupation to potentially where they went to school and you have a bit of a mosaic effect that you have to take a step backwards and, and figure out, well, what combination of this information is going to identify that person? And I know, I know Kim maybe disagrees with me. I like, I like to try and talk to counsel in the court to figure out some sort of safe words, so to speak, right? I mean, most, most my experience, judges and counsel will be reasonable on agreeing that certain things like a school where a young person went to. Well, there may, be, there may be a thousand teenage girls that go to this high school. So you can say she went to a certain high school. Maybe you can't, but I try and have those conversations. I think if, if a media organization is facing contempt of court, it needs to be an order that has enough certainty that that's fairness. But I know some people like to ask for forgiveness later and, and uh, maybe just, you know, guess a little bit about what might be safe. Here, here's a here's an example that anybody can from the panel can weigh in on um, who, have, who have thoughts because it arises often enough a victim's parent gives an interview obviously the vic identifying the victim's parent identifies the victim so you've got a problem with that what steps do you take in the presentation of the interview um, do you show them in shadow do you distort their voice, right? I mean, I don't know if you have a particular practice, Bupinder, on that or... or, or yeah, I, I think identity, um, depending on the voice, that, that one really does depend. I think in gang situations, probably more, you know, more you want to mask the voice and so on and so forth. There's a imminent threat or danger there. Um, but yes, shooting in silhouette, um, don't shoot the face, shoot hands, shoot somewhere else, or, you know, it's behind the headshot, facing the reporter, you come up with other ways of ensuring that you can shoot the interview, have, have the question and answer portion on tape, but making sure that you're not um, in any way, shape or form identifying them. Um, yes. What about the blurred photo? Yes, this is the blurred photo. So I get so many emails about this. Um, why did you blur the photo? Um, we can tell who it is. It's so and so. Um, what's your problem? What is wrong with you? Like it's all <laughs> sorts of emails like that. Uh, we end up getting every time. Um, 
this photo comes up. Um, but it's touchy. Like if you're going to pixelate or blur a photo, there's a there's a fine line where a little less blurring and that would be a violation. Yes, that is another thing too. Like, you know, um, there is such thing as not blurring enough. Yeah. And that can that can land you in trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we try to ensure that if we're going to blur, we make sure that we're taking away, you know, certain identifiable features, you know, eyes, nose, mouth, you know, those kinds of things. It's very important to make sure that you're really effectively blurring um, because just a general blur that you might be able to put on any kind of, you know, ordinary editing system may not be enough um, and still might reveal the person's identity. Um, uh, Fred, just... So how would it work for websites like maybe tags or topic page or um, like it, tags? So if say one case you can easily see all together, maybe a publication then has come into place after. So like yeah, topic pages and, and tags. I know it's a really important question. So the just to sort of um, repeat it, um, Francesca points out that you know you might have a, a a page organized so that it automatically brings up tag pages or related story and there's a bunch of links. Um, if you've got a story that you that now contains a band identity, you have to take steps so that does not happen. You know, like, because, because now suddenly you've got the story that, you know, contains this blurred photo and the link right beside it has a photo of the person. Like, and you're like, oh boy. So, so you, and it's tough because your technology might be set up in a way where you need your people to take steps to, to disable those kinds of things to make sure you're not going to be in violation by connecting to a scrub story or I'm sorry, a not scrub story. Uh, Dan, I've got a question for clarification about uh, pub bands where they uh, clearly cover the victim and they also refer to covering witnesses who have testified however the accused takes the stand and then becomes a witness. Does the pub band then cover the accused as well? Um, well, in my experience, I've never, I've never haven't, haven't seen a ban generally on every witness who testified. I've seen bans referring to witnesses who've testified um, for the Crown as undercover officers, for example. Um, so that, I mean, I would be railing against a ban that's in that kind of a vague category that you know, every witness that testifies has a ban, like what would possible justification could that, could there be for that? So maybe there is an example that I just haven't noticed on, on that one. Yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah, well, and it's, I mean, well, often you'll, you'll get these- What about the sex assault trial where it's a, it was a sex, yeah. So then you identify the the perpetrator, and they're related to the victim. Well, you might have that situation. Um, yeah, that that can arise, but usually they'll have, they'll have, actually have a ruling on the act, whether the perpetrator is or not. Um, sometimes the um, you know when you have these problematic bands, which is you cannot identify certain witnesses, but then the band doesn't want to name the witnesses because then their names yeah. are out there. So then you're like trying to guess what or, or have to sleuth out what witnesses you can't identify. You know, because I'm sure you've had that situation before. Okay, every and, week. And, and, you know, so then it's like certain people have to be AB. And, yeah. Okay, we have a couple what? of questions. And then we're going to go to the final quiz because we're actually over time. But, but let's okay. keep the Dan, party going for a couple of minutes. Dan, one question here. Okay. Um, what, what happens if you have a publication ban, like what do you call it? Um, at one time we used to see rape cases and, and that, but then we had women com coming out and saying, you know, I want my name, I want to speak out sort of thing. What happens when you have somebody who is under a publication ban, um, but they don't want to be? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that happens. Uh, it happened in the John Gomeshi trial, for example, where, where a couple of the, of uh, the, um, the complainants in that case decided they didn't want to be anonymous anymore. Um, and the, um, the protocol there is that Crown Council, um, by default, asks for a ban on the identities of all the complainants. But if a complainant says, I don't want the ban, Crown Council will go back and have the judge undo the ban, which they did in Gomeshi. I've had cases where we've gone back years later after the perpetrator finally died 
and the and the and the victim was prepared to come forward, and we had to go and get a special court order on doing the ban. But usually, if it's during the trial, the Crown Council will do it as soon as the victim says they want their name no longer banned, and that and that's you know that's a personal choice that they make, right? Um, okay. Oh, there's a follow up question, and then we're going to go to big quiz. Back to the question Brent had, uh, I start covering a lot of cases in provincial court and they start with 486 and 517 bans and the 486 covers witnesses. And I've had uh, lawyers uh, suggesting to me that the accused might be called as a witness and the ban covers them, no matter what the charge. Yeah. And I, it, it's really irksome. But it's not, I, I've got to say, I haven't, I mean, the, the, the 486 says a judge may yeah. issue bans on witnesses. Certain certain people like sex. But this is this is before they, we get to trial. To. The ban is just asked for, and it's in place on the file. Yeah. And then the lawyers are sort of using it as a club to try and intimidate. Yeah, I, I would get that ban turfed. I, mean, I generally I, ignore I, it. Call me. <laughs> call me. We'll get into. It. Okay. Um, here's a quiz about how what you would do with identity bans. Uh, you can take the next slide. Yeah. It's on the same code, and I'll launch it. The um. The question is, what things, which of these are okay by way of complying with identity ban? A, she was a 15-year-old grade 10 student at Warren Miller High School. B, her mother, Gail, who owns a popular Burnaby florist business, says her daughter was planning a career in journalism. C, her good friend, Amanda Smith, says everyone at their school is still in shock. D, all of the above meaning all of the above are okay, or E, none of the above, meaning none of the above are okay. So let's see, let's see what the room thinks about, about these. Dad, can I ask you a question when people are voting? Sure. Um, okay, just going back to the copyright question, my question was, how much would it cost to get a lawyer to write a letter? Wouldn't it be cheaper or the same to pay the 2000? Um, well, that's, that's often the case, right? I mean, it's like- No, it's I'm not like, trying to put you on the spot, but I think it's good for people to understand that one might cost as much or more than the other. That's right. And and um, um, it's, you know, I mean, for a general, for, for an image that's not like the Loch Ness Monster, $2,000 is a very aggressive price for to, to be asked. So, you know, might like, but then you say to your lawyer, well, what, what, do you, what would you cost to charge to write a letter? And the answer is going to be, well- by the time I actually amass the facts and spend a couple of hours and then write a proper letter, it's probably a thousand bucks, you know, uh, and but then there's going to be back and forth. So it's another thousand bucks. So, you, you know, like mm -hmm. sometimes just, just putting up to experience and paying the money is economically the thing, even though you probably got a, a valid point on fair, fair dealing in many cases okay. um, or, or a valid point on, you know, even if not, it's not worth 2000 bucks for me to have used it once. So. Okay, I'm. Uh, let's see, what are our. Let's see here. We've got none of the above is the winning choice, 71%. None of the above is the winning choice. Um, and then following that 18%, um, she was a 15 year old grade 10 student at Warren Miller High School. And then. After that, we've got 7% say right. all of the above. Okay, well, I'm not sure what you might think, Dan. Um, from, my, from my point of view, the room is right. Every one, of, every one of those is a dangerously identifying statement. And so none of the above are safe. So, so well done, us. And I think we're, we're beyond time. I'm sorry to have gone over a little yep, bit. We're at the end there. Thank you so much for all of your questions, everyone, and big thanks to our panelists. Um, I see many of you guys filling out the evaluation forms already. That's gonna help us put on next year's workshop. And um, just before we end, um, I'd like to invite Janet Mitchell up again to speak a few words. Are you, you got closing? You're good? Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Can we please give all the panelists a big round of applause? Thank you, you guys were good too. Thank you so much.